All right, welcome to the Cooper Conference. I'm sorry I can't be with you in real time, but I need to work in the ICU today, but I'm there with you in spirit. So we're gonna talk about hypoxemia physiology that's actually helpful. So we've all gotten lectures on hypoxemia physiology in medical school and residency, and I think most of these lectures are unnecessarily complicated. So unless you're on Mount Everest or you're jacking up an anesthesia machine, there are only really three mechanisms of hypoxemia that you need to worry about. Hypoventilation, VQ mismatch, and shunting. In hypoventilation, the alveoli and the bronchi are working perfectly, and the problem is simply there's not enough ventilation getting to the lung. So the alveoli are burning through oxygen faster than they're getting oxygen. Probably the most commonly encountered cause of hypoventilation is a central brain drive problem where the brain is simply not stimulating the body to breathe. And we're most familiar with this probably in the context of opioid intoxication. So folks come in, their respiratory rate is low, they're substantially altered, they're not breathing. This is relatively easy to diagnose. Other causes of central hypoventilation are folks with brainstem strokes or substantial brain pathology. And once again, relatively straightforward to diagnose on the basis of substantially altered mental status. So the second type of hypoventilation is a respiratory mechanical problem where the brain is stimulating the body to breathe, but the body is unable to breathe either due to a tracheal obstruction or upper airway obstruction or neuromuscular problem involving the diaphragm and the chest ball. For patients with acute respiratory mechanical problem, they will compensate for this with tachypnea and they will only develop hypercapnia and hypoxemia when they're really on the brink of death. So most of these patients will present with tachypnea and they'll be struggling to breathe, but they won't necessarily be substantially hypercapnic nor hypoxemic. And things of this nature would include epiglottitis, acute transverse myelitis, Guillain-Barre syndrome, neuromuscular problems, things like periodic hypokalemic paralysis, so some sort of acute neuromuscular or airway catastrophe. And once again, these patients are not really going to present with hypoxemia usually. They will present with almost like an asphyxial problem. So the last cause of hypoventilation is a chronic respiratory mechanical problem. And this can be very difficult to diagnose. So these are folks with, for example, chronic muscular dystrophy or chronic chronic obesity hypoventilation syndrome. And what happens here is that the brain adapts to a higher level of PaCO2. So the brain is kind of okay with this and it doesn't really stimulate the patient to drive their respiratory rate too, too high. So patients may show up on a couple liters of oxygen and they're not an extremist, they don't look too bad. Most of these patients can be diagnosed because they may be carrying some sort of chronic or obvious diagnosis of a neuromuscular problem. But occasionally, very rarely, you might encounter this for the first time and it can be a little tricky to find this. So getting back to the mainstream here, VQ mismatch. This basically involves a partial obstruction of flow or partial dysfunction of some alveoli. So some alveoli are hogging all of the ventilation and other alveoli are getting inadequately ventilated. Now the problem is that the ventilation hogs here are wasting this ventilation. They don't need that ventilation. They are saturating 100% before getting the extra ventilation. The extra ventilation does nothing for them. Meanwhile, the other alveoli are starved for ventilation. They become hypoxemic and the net effect is that overall blood becomes hypoxemic. So VQ mismatch is the answer to everything in pulmonary medicine. If you're ever asked for a question on, you know, the boards or rounding and, you know, why is this patient hypoxemic, you can always guess VQ mismatch and you're generally going to be right. So this includes patients with asthma, COPD, pulmonary embolism, most patients with bronchopneumonia where they have kind of like some obstruction of the bronchi, but the lung is basically functioning. Most of your heart failure patients, most of your interstitial lung disease patients. So our final cause of hypoxemia is shunting. This involves some situation where the blood does not come in contact with oxygen and there is no way for the blood to ever come in contact with oxygen. The most common way that this occurs is an alveolar filling process. For example, some alveoli are filled completely with pus in the case of pneumonia and no matter how much oxygen you give this patient, no matter how much that patient breathes, there is not going to get any oxygen to this alveolus and all the blood going to that alveolus is going to be deoxygenated. So another cause of shunting is a vascular or intracardiac shunt and what's going on here is deoxygenated blue blood from the right side of the heart is pouring directly into the left side of the heart without ever coming in contact with the alveoli. So even if the alveoli may be functioning perfectly, this patient will still desaturate. So shunts may be caused by alveolar filling processes, most commonly things like Sockton pneumonia, severe atelectasis with total lung collapse, ARDS. Sometimes you can see folks with kind of a diffuse infiltrate on their chest x-ray, um, but what they have are kind of just patchy areas where the alveoli are totally dysfunctional in ARDS, and that can cause a shunt. 
you can have folks with bronchial obstruction of a large bronchus. And that's probably what's going on in the ICU when you have an intubated patient who suddenly desaturates and they get suctioned and then their saturation pops right up. Those are intermittent kind of bronchial obstruction due to mucus bugging. And of course, vascular shunting like intracardiac shunts and pulmonary AVMs. So we talked about hypoventilation, VQ mismatch, and shunting. So how can we actually use this information clinically? So let's think about what will happen if we expose patients with hypoventilation, VQ mismatch, or shunting to 100% oxygen or a very high inhaled amounts of oxygen. In hypoventilation and VQ mismatch, if we're flooding these patients with oxygen, there's so much oxygen in their trachea that even if there's not like a huge bulk flow going to these alveoli in hypoventilation, or even if there's like an obstruction here in VQ mismatch, the oxygen concentration is so high that enough oxygen will get into the alveoli that the saturation will be okay. Alternatively, for our patients with shunt, it, they don't care, it doesn't matter. You can give these patients 100% oxygen, it's still not gonna get to that alveolus and they will still be hypoxemic. So this is a super important concept here. Hypoventilation and VQ mismatch can be fixed with oxygen, whereas supplemental oxygen will not fix a shunt. So what this means is that refractory hypoxemia must always be due to a shunt. So when you get called that there's a patient who has hypoxemia that's not responding to oxygen, you can know over the phone right then and there that that's a patient with shunt physiology even before you go down to the emergency department to see that patient. So we're going to start out with the basic stuff. We're gonna look at their lungs with ultrasounds. Perhaps we're gonna look at a chest x-ray. And most of the time, we're gonna find some sort of obvious pathology in the lungs, which will explain their hypoxemia. We can move on from there. But what if the lung ultrasound and the chest x-ray are normal? Then we need to consider the possibility of an intracardiac shunt or a vascular shunt. And the way that we can evaluate those at the bedside is to inject agitated saline while doing a bedside pocus. That's a pretty simple thing to do. I think anyone who's interested in emergency medicine or critical care should probably know how to do that. And you can identify at the bedside patients with intracardiac shunting or pulmonary AVMs. You can differentiate between those two pathologies based on when the bubbles show up in the left side of the heart. Now, what if your shunt study is negative, there are no bubbles on the left side of the heart, then you get into a weird box here. Maybe this patient has a strange bronchial obstruction. Perhaps they have methemoglobinemia. It's a little outside the scope of this talk, but it's relatively easy to diagnose once you think about it. So let's get back to bread and butter here. What about our hypoxemic patient who is responsive to oxygen? So you're called to evaluate a patient who is on two to four, maybe five liters of oxygen and their saturation response to the oxygen. What's going on here? So you can know a priori that these patients probably have either VQ mismatch or hypoventilation. So our approach to a patient with hypoxemia responsive to oxygen, now first we're going to look at the patient. If they're clearly not breathing, maybe they're probably hypoventilating. If they are asphyxiating, perhaps they have an upper airway obstruction. These things are usually going to be relatively clear to detect. And honestly, they're not going to really manifest with hypoxemia. So moving on from there, most of these patients are going to have VQ mismatch. So here's where we do our basic pulmonary workup. We listen to them. We do an ultrasound. So perhaps they have bronchospathy spasm, asthma, COPD, perhaps they have pneumonia, heart failure, stuff like that. This is our bread and butter evaluation for hypoxemia that we're used to doing all the time. If that is negative, this is when you need to think about pulmonary embolism. So you're going to pull out your D-dimer, your CT angio, and perhaps diagnose a PE or maybe find some sort of subtle lung pathology that you missed previously. If that is negative, then you need to reconsider the possibility that the patient may have hypoventilation and check an ABG to look for hypercapnia. This is a rare occurrence, but occasionally you may see this. So finally, a couple pearls and deep thoughts to leave you with. First of all, one theme which is run through this lecture, and hopefully you picked up on this by now, is that your ultrasound examination, your chest x-ray, your history and physical are vastly more useful than checking an arterial blood gas for the evaluation of hypoxemia. Almost all hypoxic patients are going to have a very similar blood gas. They're going to have a low PaO2, they're going to have a low PaCO2, because most of them are going to be a bit tachypnic, and that blood gas is not going to differentiate any of these different pathologies. So if your approach to hypoxemia is starting with a blood gas, you're wasting a lot of time and incurring a lot of discomfort on your patients for no good reason. Arterial blood gases can be useful, but only for specific questions. So if you have a reason to suspect the patient has hypercapnia, or if you have a reason to think about methemoglobinemia, that's certainly a good reason to do a blood gas. Understanding physiology can help you appreciate situations that should not occur. So for example, you are called to evaluate an asthmatic patient with refractory hypoxemia. So asthma 
causes VQ mismatch. VQ mismatch should respond well to oxygen. So right then and there, when someone calls you and they say, I've got an asthmatic patient with refractory hypoxemia, you can know on the phone, something else is probably going on with that patient. Maybe they have a pneumothorax, maybe they have mucus plugging and severe atelectasis, but you should know immediately that something is complicating their asthma. You need to evaluate that right away. Something really wrong going on with that patient. And finally, sometimes you will see patients with a shunt and cardiogenic shock. And this is a really bad situation because what happens with cardiogenic shock is your mixed venous oxygen saturation drops really low. Then if you have a shunt and you are shunting really deoxygenated mixed venous blood over to the left side of the heart, then you're in a really bad situation because your sat's going to drop even further. And perhaps that will impact on your cardiac function. And this can cause a vicious spiral of desaturation and low cardiac output. That's really bad. The cool thing about this situation is that occasionally you will identify these patients who have a shunt and they're in shock and you look at their heart, it's not moving. You look at their IVC, there's just like no blood flow in their IVC. And you can give them an inotropes, typically epinephrine, for example, you can increase their cardiac output. And as you increase their cardiac output, the oxygen saturation in their mixed venous blood will improve and their peripheral saturation will improve and everything will get better. So this is not a very common situation, but occasionally you may encounter this. And it's really kind of magical to treat someone's refractory hypoxemia with an epinephrine infusion. So to recap, we've talked about the physiology of hypoventilation, VQ mismatch, and shunt. So hypoventilation can be caused by central respiratory dry problems like opioid intoxication, brainstem disease, upper airway obstruction like laryngeal edema, or neuromuscular weakness. Most causes of hypoventilation are going to be diagnosable based on your essentially history, physical examination, and usually this isn't too subtle, although some patients with chronic obesity hypoventilation syndrome or chronic muscular weakness may be difficult to diagnose. VQ mismatch, this is your bread and butter hypoxemia, COPD, asthma, really most pulmonary diseases. And the key here is that patients with hypoventilation and VQ mismatch will respond to low amounts of supplemental oxygen. Alternatively, folks with shunt will not respond response to oxygen well. So these are going to be patients manifesting with refractory hypoxemia. And these are going to be patients with total lung consolidation or parts of their lungs totally consolidated, large bronchus obstruction, or intracardiac shunting of blood from the right side of their heart to the left side of their heart. Shunt is going to be the cause of your most critically ill hypoxemic patients. So it's useful to have a organized approach to these folks, including potentially a bubble study at the bedside to identify folks with right to left shunting. Thanks so much. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and have a great day.